Before I start, uh, let me say a few words about myself. So my name's Colin McCabe. Um, I work on HDFS and some related technologies at Cloudera. Um, I'm a committer on the HDFS and Hadoop projects. Previously, I worked on the Ceph distributed file system, and I've done some other storagey stuff, too. So uh, Hadoop, a technology that needs no introduction, but let's introduce it anyway. Um, <laughs> the open source framework for big data, um, started by Doug Cutting and Mike uh, Caffarella in 2005. So there are a few big ideas behind Hadoop. Um, it's distributed. It lets you scale out. It's robust against node failures. Um, it brings the computation of the data because moving the data can take time. Moving the computation is a lot easier. And finally, uh, we use commodity hardware in general, not specialized hardware. So we, we allow you to bring your own hardware to Hadoop. Um, oops. <laughs> Sorry. So HDFS is the Hadoop distributed file system. And it decides where and how to store data in Hadoop. Um, <clears throat> with HDFS, we have a few different nodes. We have data nodes. Those are the nodes that store data, of course. Uh, the name node, which handles metadata. Journal nodes, which store metadata. Um, there are some other uh, daemons I could talk about, but those are the main ones to, to know. I'm also going to be talking a lot about something called the DFS client in this talk. Basically, that's the HDFS client software that you use to interact with HDFS. Now, there are other ways to interact with HDFS besides the DFS client. There's stuff like web HDFS, HTTPFS, but the DFS client is still the most high performance interface, and it's the main interface, one with the most features. So it's kind of the one to talk about when we talk about efficiency improvements. So, you know, as I mentioned, HDFS provides this shared namespace. That's pretty important to us because we have a bunch of files and we really want to be able to access them from any node in the cluster, not just the node that wrote them. Otherwise, of course, a local file system would be fine. So every DFS client is going to have access to every file in the cluster through the means of the shared namespace. Um, oops. Usually we co-locate the uh, DFS client with the data node so that we can avoid going over that network hop if we uh, are reading local data. So <clears throat> this is, you know, again, it's part of moving the computation of the data is co-locating that DFS client right on the same node as the data node and oftentimes running other daemons too on top of the, the DFS client. So this is sort of a typical HDFS setup in 2014. I know that a lot of people like to introduce HDFS with like a, a simpler setup, but I really like to highlight the high availability stuff because I think it's important to a real production deployment to, you know, to, to do that. And I also think that, you know, the fact, the idea that the name node is a single point of failure is many years out, out of date, but you still hear people repeating it, so it's important to, to sort of dispel that. Um, in this cluster, you can see that we have a primary name node and a standby name node. Standby name node is ready to take over if the primary fails. Um, the journal nodes are where we're actually going to be storing our edits. I'm not going to go into too much detail about edits in this presentation, since it's mostly about the read pipeline. But um, one way to look at it is the journal nodes are going to store a lot of the, the metadata that we have. Um, now, as I said before, we like to co-locate the DFS client and the data node so that we can avoid those copies whenever possible. Typically, you'd have a lot more data nodes than just three, but I figured I'd make some concessions to uh, slides. <clears throat> so reading from HDFS is basically a matter of, um, you start by talking to the primary name node, and the name node will give you, um, you tell the name node, I'd like to open this file. The name node will say, well, here's where the first block of the file is located, and here's the name of the block. 
So at that point, the client can take the name node out of the pipeline completely and just talk directly to the data node. So this is kind of a key performance advantage of HDFS, I would say. When you compare it to systems like NFS, where the data and the metadata always have to go through the same network interface, with HDFS, that simply isn't the case. The client can turn around and talk to the data nodes without having to talk to the name node or tell the name node that it's doing this, necessarily. Um, in this case, I mean, yes, we did talk to the name node beforehand, but we don't necessarily have to. So writing to HDFS is a little more complicated. We're not going to go into too much detail because, again, this is about the read path. But I wanted to present it for completeness. Um, typically, when you're creating a file, you're going to talk to the primary name node. It's going to say, um, here are the data nodes where you should place your first block on. So the fact that I said data nodes is no mistake. We need, we're doing more than one node here. Usually, we do 3x replication so that if two nodes fail, we can still uh, avoid losing the data. So at that point, the, um, the DFS client constructs a pipeline. And basically, each node in this pipeline is going to pass the data on to the next node and pass back X. So one analogy that I've heard that I really liked was a bucket brigade, where people keep passing the water along. That's kind of what's happening here. Um, when we're writing, we also do a lot of other tricks, too. Like, we buffer while we are um, in the process of writing. So we don't block the client while we're doing our writes. That involves having background threads and, and stuff like that. So, you know, there's some design assumptions here in HDFS. Um, one of them is that reads are more common than writes. Because otherwise, how could we afford to make writes do 3x the work of reads? A reader only has to talk to one data node. A writer has to talk to three. Um, even if we're not talking to them directly, we're still generating the traffic and, and so forth. <clears throat> the other is that big files are common. So we'd like data operations that we do on data nodes to be more common than metadata operations that we have to talk to name nodes about. Um, and finally, we're optimized for streaming workloads. So we like to avoid seeks. There are some other uh, sort of design assumptions that are more optimized for streaming. And we are actually trying to um, rethink this streaming assumption in some places. We'd like to support clients like HBase better that don't necessarily always stream. But it's worth noting that the original design was very much focused around the streaming paradigm. <clears throat> So let's talk about a few stacks just to kind of motivate what's going on here. Uh, HDFS isn't necessarily very interesting to people by itself, although personally I find it very interesting. Um, most people want to actually do stuff with their cluster. So you know, in order to do that, you need a storage stack. And um, you may find something like uh, MapReduce, Impala, or Spark thrown into the mix. Here are some examples of, uh, of stacks you might see. So one person might be running a web application uh, with HBase underneath and HDFS running on beneath HBase. Um, that guy's probably going to care a lot about latency. Um, he's going to care a lot about the guarantees we can make about latency. He's going to be doing a lot of seeks, potentially. Um, another client is a MapReduce job running on top of a MapReduce framework, like MR1 or MR2. Um, MapReduce jobs tend to be more streaming frameworks or streaming uh, workloads. They typically will start at the beginning of the file and read till the end, although not always, um, but it's typical. Uh, finally, Impala is another important client for us. So Impala is um, Cloudera's uh, open source uh, distributed SQL query engine. So <clears throat> Impala can give you uh, interactive, real-time results for your SQL queries on Hadoop. And Impala can read from HDFS directly. So it's another important client of ours. And it's another client which tends to do uh, streaming uh, workloads. So you know every byte that we read from HDFS has to go through this DFS client library. Again, few exceptions. We have WebHDFS. We have a few other clients like that. 
But <clears throat> in general, it, it, DFS client performance is very Im important to us. Um, I should also mention the DFS client needs to verify that the checksum of the data that we're reading matches the data itself. So this is for two reasons. One reason is because there may be network issues, network errors that are introduced. Um, the other issue is the disk, of course, can be unreliable. So we, by default, will store four bytes of checksum for every 512 bytes of data. <clears throat> and we need to make sure that we're doing that verification all the time. So how can we improve DFS performance? Well, first we have to quantify what we mean by improvement. So there's a lot of dimensions along which we can quantify performance. One of the most obvious ones is CPU utilization. You know, how much CPU am I sucking down? Well, more is worse, right? Because we want to do other stuff on this cluster, useful stuff. Um, another important one, which is a little more subtle, is memory bandwidth. The more copies we do in HDFS, the less memory bandwidth there is available for the rest of the system. Because these chips, you know, there's only so much memory bandwidth they have to go to main memory. And once you fill that, then that's a resource that's, that's used up for the time being. Latency, of course, is another important performance dimension. So you can certainly imagine a system which gets very poor latency, but very great bandwidth. Um, we definitely don't want to do that, or at least we don't want to do that exclusively, because we have clients who care very much about latency. Um, we, we'd like to realize all the disk bandwidth that we have, so we'd like to keep all the disks spinning if we can. If we can find a way to utilize all of them, that would be ideal. Typically, there would be like 10 disks on a node. That's pretty usual. And finally, scalability, right? <clears throat> so if we, if we discover a great solution that doesn't scale past one node, we haven't really discovered a great solution. So it's worth mentioning that a lot of these things are very workload dependent. So you may find workloads that are extremely CPU intensive, and they benefit a lot when HDFS starts using less CPU. I find MapReduce to often be very CPU intensive. Um, there's also workloads that are very I.O. intensive. And again, then you just sort of want to provide more I.O. So you really have to ask yourself, what's the bottleneck before you start to optimize a specific workload? It's also worth noting that this is very dependent on the cluster. So, you know, that 10 gigabit cluster, which provides maybe a gigabyte a second or more of throughput, between nodes is going to be a lot different than a one gigabit cluster, a one gigi cluster, sorry, that's going to provide a tenth of that. It's just going to be a dramatic difference in many workloads because you'll often find yourself limited on the network. Uh, and similarly, how many disks do you have? Well, if you have a lot of disks, then you're going to be relatively CPU starved and you're going to be mostly good for archival and backup, stuff like that. If you have few disks, then you're going to be able to do a lot with what you have, suitable for CPU, high CPU workloads. But obviously, you're going to find it more difficult to store things sometimes. I think there's also an advantage to um, having a lot of disks in terms of I.O. bandwidth, too. So that's why a lot of people come up with 10 as the sweet spot. But you have to make sure that your hardware can actually push data to all those disks at once, something that cheaper motherboards sometimes just can't do. So you have to keep that in mind. So I'm going to talk about a few DFS client overheads to start off with. One of them is CPU overhead. The next is um, the TCP three-way handshake, um, the overhead of hard disk seeks, and copying data from buffer to buffer. So to be more specific, I'm going to talk about how we can uh, mitigate some of these overheads in each case. So, you know, as I said earlier, with, with CPU, less is more. We really want to use less CPU if we can. Um, the more cycles we save, the more our clients can use. So one way that we saved a lot of cycles was actually switching to an optimized native checksum implementation. So Intel has a built-in uh, CRC32 instruction, which is part of SSC 4.2. 
Um, when we used this instead of a native Java version or a pure Java version, our, our checksum overhead went from 50% to 15% in some benchmarks. So this is just a reflection that it's sort of hard to beat one instruction that was implemented by the CPU architects for doing checksums. <clears throat> Another thing we can do to reduce CPU overhead is to reduce locking overhead. And one good example of this is HDFS 5276, something I worked on. Um, thread, local file, uh, thread local statistics in file system. So we, this JIRA moved us towards um, tracking read and write statistics on a per thread basis rather than on a global basis in the DFS client. And this sub substantially reduces the overhead that we experience with locking because we no longer are just hitting this one area of memory constantly. Instead, each thread is hitting its own area of memory, and we only actually sum them up and present them as a result when needed. So it turns out to be a huge improvement for massively multi-threaded programs. So let's talk about the TCP three-way handshake. So first of all, what is it? Well, I mean, whenever you establish a TCP connection, you have to go through the three-way handshake. And the handshake begins with the client sending a SYN packet to the server. The server will then send back a SYN ACK packet. And finally, the client finishes with an ACK. And then the connection is established. So it's worth noting here that we have to pay an entire round trip time before we can actually start sending data. That may not actually seem like a lot, in a cluster where everything's sort of local. But it does add up. So in Hadoop 1, we actually established a new TCP connection each time we read some bytes from the uh, data node. So we would you know, go through this three-way handshake. We would go through connection establishment, a lot of other stuff that's Hadoop specific. And then we'd finally send the data. Then we'd close the connection. And then we'd have to go through the whole thing again um, when doing another read. But it turns out there's a better way than that. We can keep a, a, a pool of connections around. Um, we did exactly that in HDFS 941, reusing TCP connections to the data node. So again, this, this avoids the overhead of the three-way handshake and the connection setup. Uh, it requires us to set up a socket cache. It requires some data exceiver changes. But uh, overall, it's been very positive for us. There are other ways to avoid TCP overheads, of course. One of them is avoiding TCP. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few slides. But, <clears throat> oops. I seem to be stuck on this one. There we go. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is uh, how do we reduce hard disk seeks? Now, strictly speaking, this isn't a DFS client issue. This is a data node issue, because the data node's doing the read most of the time. But it seemed logical to talk about it here, despite that. So a little bit of background here. Most of you probably already know this, but seeks can be very expensive when using hard disks. A typical time, maybe 10 milliseconds. I've seen lower numbers quoted for more expensive disks, but in general, it's going to directly flow out of what's your RPM, what's your revolutions per minute. And typically, that's going to be between you know, 10K and 20K. 20K is only for the super, super rich. But, um, <laughs> so you know, in general, you want to minimize these seeks, because they're, they're a big deal on hard disks. Um, one good way to do it is to use something called read ahead. Rather than reading a few bytes at a time, we read a few megabytes at a time. Um, this allows the hard disk to make larger contiguous reads because it can sort of see all these requests coming in and schedule them appropriately. So <clears throat> Linux already does a few kilobytes of read ahead. We found a substantial performance improvement if we tell it to do a few megabytes. And so in HDFS 3697, uh, we did this. We enabled fadvise read ahead by default. Now, fadvise is basically a system call that allows you to give some guidance to Linux on how much read ahead it should do. 
Um, so again, this is another thing that requires J and I from within Java. One thing that we found was that different clients needed different levels of read ahead. So for example, HBase might do small random reads. It might do small 64K reads. But something like a MapReduce job might do long reads. It might be reading the entire file. So in that case, it's appropriate to read a few megabytes. So we made this configurable on a, for, on a per file basis with HDFS 48.17. Now when I say per file, I mean per open file. So it's not like it's a permanent attribute or anything like that. It's a client side thing. So it's nice to be able to turn down read ahead when you don't actually want us to do all these unnecessary reads. So a related concept is drop behind. Sometimes you only need to read a file once and you don't want to put its contents into the page cache. So a, little, a word of explanation here. When you say, the page cache is a cache which resides in the operating system. The page cache is the reason why not every read goes to disk, not every write goes to disk. There's a staging area in between and that's exactly what the page cache is. So, uh, you could think of read ahead and drop behind as giving you a little more control over that page cache that exists. And this is also configurable on a per file basis. It's a little more difficult to use than read ahead because read ahead is something that most people want. But drop behind is something that you only really want if you're not going to reuse the, the file, not going to reread it. So <clears throat> let's talk about these copies. So I've been talking a lot about I've been mentioning copies a lot in this talk. You know, conserving memory bandwidth. Well, what does that mean concretely? Well, it means we don't want to do a lot of copies from buffer to buffer uh, if we can avoid it. Ideally, we would do uh, one copy. Uh, in the literature, this is known as zero copies because computer scientists are often off by one. But uh, <laughs> really, we'd like to do only one copy. We'd like to copy it from the disk and then we're done. So when we started with these optimizations, we saw that we had a lot of copies going on. Well, we had to copy it from the hard disk into the page cache. Then we had to copy it into the data node process onto the heap, the Java heap. Then we had to copy it to the DFS client by sending it over the TCP stream. Then the DFS client had to copy it to the application. So we'd like to find a way to eliminate some of these copies, if possible. So one way that we can eliminate a copy is, is something called short circuit local reads. Um, the insight behind this is that the DFS client is often on the same node as the data that it's reading. And we talked about this earlier. Basically, the idea is minimize the network traffic, conserve the network as a resource. So given that this is true, why can't we just directly read the data from the file system without going through the data node? That way we could avoid a copy. We could avoid the copy into the process, into the uh, data, sorry. We could avoid a copy into the uh, DFS client process, rather. Sorry. <laughs> so this is the old read path, um, the TCP read path which incidentally is still used for remote reads. So calling it the old read path is perhaps a little bit misleading. But in any case, the DFS client will use the data transfer protocol to ask the data node for data. The data node, in its turn, will read that data from the data directories, and then it will send it over TCP. So simple enough. In HDFS 2246, we added another read path, which basically involves the DFS client asking the data node not for data, but for the location of the data on the file system by means of get uh, block local path info. So, and then the DFS client will simply open those files directly. So, you know, this is great, um, but there are a few problems with it. One problem is that there's some security implications here. So if the DFS client can open files in these directories, what else could it read? Possibly even blocks that it's not supposed to access. 
Um, there's also configuration headaches here because now we have to set up some way within Unix to allow this DFS client process to read files that are normally written and read by this other process, the data node. So there's this whole elaborate, you have to set up a Unix group, add users to this group, um, make sure that it's rolled out on every node. So in general, it's a big configuration hassle. So we implemented another uh, better short circuit scheme called HDFS 347. So you may notice the JIRA number is lower. <laughs> this is only because it was open longer, uh, not, not any other reason. So, but anyway, um, with HDFS 347, the DFS client, again, doesn't send for the data. It sends for something else. But the something else is a little bit different this time. Instead of being a location, it's actually a file descriptor. And the data node opens the file. So the, perform the, uh, the access control checks are still performed on the data node. So we avoid all that configuration headache. But then we send that open file over a Unix domain socket to the DFS client. And the nice thing about this is that now the DFS client can read it as if it were local. And of course, because it's a read-only file descriptor, the DFS client can't modify it either. So it's, it's kind of nice that way. One thing about this is that it does require JNI because Java doesn't have a way to access Unix domain sockets. So we needed to sort of invent one. And JNI was the only game in town for doing that. But once you get past enabling JNI, it's actually pretty nice. So you can see we saw some pretty nice performance improvements from this. This particular test was a 64K random read test on a one gigabyte file. Uh, the, the results on the very left are HDFS 347. Uh, on the very right are TCP. So you can see that we get, a, we get a nice performance boost there. It's also worth noting that these results were uncached. So there was nothing in the cache at the time we started, which kind of explains why we're sort of hovering around hard disk speed because you can't go faster than the hard disk can actually supply you data. But, okay. So, with the data node out of the picture, we're basically reading directly from the page cache into the DFS client. Can we avoid some copies inside the DFS client, though? So, Originally, in the local block reader, we had a code path kind of like this, where we would read from the page cache into a, a checksum buffer. We would perform the checksums on the data in that buffer, and then we would copy data from that buffer into the DFS client's buffer that it would pass to us. So we had some good reasons for doing this. <clears throat> One of the reasons was uh, you need at least 512 bytes to do a checksum, right? So you can't check some any unit less than that. So you often end up needing kind of this bounce buffer, uh, especially if you're doing small reads. Like if I'm reading one byte at a time, well, I can't check some one byte at a time. I have to check some 512 bytes. So that's one very good reason to do this. Another reason is because, um, as I talked about earlier, we use J and I in order to do the check summing. Well, J and I is gonna operate over byte buffer, direct byte buffers, not over uh, Java, byte arrays. So originally we didn't have support for the client using byte buffers. We only had support for the client using byte arrays. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the dis distinction between Java byte arrays and Java byte buffers. It's a little bit esoteric, I guess, but byte arrays were the old way of doing things in the language. They're the oldest way. They're just, if you make an array of bytes, that is a byte array. Byte buffer is a special class that was added later on to improve performance by improving integration with native code. So byte buffers have the special advantage that you can take their address and use it within C code that you're using. You can't do that with byte arrays because, well, garbage collection might move that thing around, so you never really know. So anyway, um, one thing that we observed, though, is that if the DFS client's doing a long read, and if it's using a direct byte buffer, or even just a regular byte buffer, 
Um, well, no, I guess it has to be direct so we can do the checksum. But <clears throat> we can simply copy the data from the page cache into that direct byte buffer that the client passed. And then we can perform the checksum on it in situ, as it were. And we don't have to do a copy. So the two JIRAs that I most associate with this are HDFS 2834, which added those byte buffer read APIs, and HDFS 5634, which was sort of a refactoring of the block reader local. It did a few other things, too, but this is certainly one of them. So at that point, we've avoided that copy in DFS client. I want to take a moment to note that if you do a small read, we still will go through the bounce buffer. Because like I said, I can't check some a four byte read. I can't check some a 16 byte read. I need those full 512 bytes. And similarly, there are some issues with alignment. So if you do a read that's not aligned, then I do have to put it through the bounce buffer. But in general, we can avoid that copy a lot of the time, which is nice. So, what if we could avoid another copy? Um, what if we could simply map the page from the OS page cache into the process's memory space? So I guess I need to sort of step back a moment to explain this one. So the OS maintains sort of the, the memory mappings of the process that you're in. And although this doesn't often come up in user level programming, these mappings can sort of be arbitrary. So they don't necessarily have to, um, just because a page has one address in one um, program doesn't mean it can't have another address in another program. Think of them as windows onto the underlying physical memory. And these windows can be moved to a different address, however you like. So in this particular case, we'd like to move these windows around so the data we're looking at can be accessed without copying it. We'd like to move the windows around so that we can look at the block data directly. No copies there. So in order to do this, we need to be able to skip the checksum because we're completely disintermediating the DFS client here. The DFS client's not involved. You just get a memory region and, well, you read from it. And that's, you know, pretty basic API there. Uh, in J this also exists in Java. You have mapped byte buffer which sort of wraps an M map, which is what we're talking about here. So it's not only native code that benefits from this, but also Java code. So <clears throat> uh, we implemented this. We implemented some nice APIs for this. And we eliminated that copy. So let's talk about um, you know, what we've gained here. So these, this benchmark was done with a highly optimized libhdfs program call, called Vexum. Vexum is pretty simple. It just computes the sum of a one gigabyte file containing floating point numbers. And it computes that sum 20 times. So it's reading the same one gigabyte file 20 times. Um, so as you can see, TCP does the poorest here. Zero copy does the best by a substantial margin. This is a throughput benchmark, just bandwidth. So you can see that, you know, getting rid of those copies does a lot for you. It really does. So when you look at the CPU consumed, you see the opposite story. We see less CPU consumed when we do zero copy. This isn't surprising, right? I mean, the more code we execute, well, the more CPU we're going to use. Uh, by the way, these numbers were gathered with perf, which is a tool that comes bundled with the kernel to do um, this kind of performance analysis. You can also see that skipping checksums does provide somewhat of a boost, but it's not enormous. It's not really the dominant thing. There's only one bar for zero copy, because with zero copy, we're always skipping the checksums. Remember, there's no way to verify the checksums with zero copy. That leads to, um, as I'll talk about a little bit later, the application needs to either do its own checksums with the zero copy, or we need to cache the data beforehand using HDFS caching to ensure that it is properly checksummed. So, you know, these have 
all been micro-level improvements in a sense. They're all sort of tweaks, hacks, that we can do to make things better on the small scale. Are there any higher level improvements we could do um, to improve things like scheduling? Now, I need to step back and talk a little bit about um, what scheduling is. So Impala has this thing called a query planner. Basically, you're going to give Impala a query. It's going to come up with a plan, which is basically where I should execute what, what operators should I do, where should I do them. And then it's going to step forward and do those things. Um, MapReduce, similarly, it's going to have to construct a plan of where it's going to put things. Um, so previously, we didn't really give that much information to these planners. Um, specifically, if you schedule multiple jobs that need the same hard disk at the same time, things are going to go slower, right? Here's an example of where I put task one and task two on the same data node, expecting I could get some parallelism there. But really what I found was that they both needed the same disk because the replica of the block they were looking at happened to be on the same disk. There's no way I could know that just by looking at the get block locations API. Because the get block locations API just tells me what data nodes the block's on. It doesn't tell me what disks it's on. So <clears throat> we added a new API which uh, expose that information in HDFS 3672. So previously, Impala could know that block B was on data nodes D1, D2, D3, but it didn't know which drives it was on on those data nodes. It had to guess, assume a uniform distribution, that sort of thing. Um, but now Impala can schedule work across the cluster so that it can keep all those drives busy at once. And so get us closer to our goal of, of using all the IO bandwidth in the cluster. So here's another example where task one and task two are now using different disks. Uh, I sort of <laughs> tried to color them according to the block they were, they were using. So we can be a lot smarter with scheduling this way. So another sort of semi-high level improvement here is HDFS caching. So I talked a little bit previously about the OS page cache, the way that Linux decides to cache things to make your life easier. Well. Linux doesn't know everything. Linux only knows what's going on on that node. So if something is cached, remember there's three data nodes in general where something's going to be located. Um, and Linux, when it's making the decision whether to cache something or not, is not going to know that something is also cached on another data node. So we may end up only with a third as much cache as we actually would like because we're not using it in a smart way. Another issue is thrashing, which is where you do a job that touches a lot of data. And basically, you find at the end your cache has nothing in it because you kicked everything out because you touched every element. And your LRU cache said everything is gone. Now, there are various hacks they have to try to avoid this. But in general, it's a difficult problem to solve if you don't have information from the upper levels. So HDFS caching pro pro uh, provides exactly that information. Uh, it allows us to explicitly ask for certain files or directories to be cached. And when they're cached, the data node will bring them into memory, do the checksum on them, and hold them in memory. So <clears throat> this has some nice advantages. One is that we can move the computation of the cache. So we can go just a little bit beyond moving the computation of the data and actually know when, where things are cached. Another is that we can skip checksums when reading the cache data. Keep the important data cached. Um, we benchmarked a 7x improvement in Impala speed with HDFS caching. So it can be really substantial on some workloads. Um, another thing is hedged reads. So I'm just going to talk about this really quickly. Basically, data nodes can be slow. We all know. When a data node is taking a long time to respond to a request, why don't we just ask another data node? Um, the worst that can happen is we'll get back two responses. And best, we'll cut off our long tail latencies in a very substantial fashion. So this helps HBase a lot. This was recently added by HDFS 5776. <sighs> OK. So we should talk a little bit about the limitations here. Well, not all clients are bottlenecked on I.O. Many MapReduce jobs in particular do a lot of CPU work. 
So lifting the I.O. bottlenecks in this way may only reveal other bottlenecks. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, not all clusters are the same. You really need to benchmark. I'm going to skip through these a little bit faster. Here's a MapReduce flame graph where each of these stacks of functions represents uh, a J stack. And this is the time doing I.O. on this word count job. So if all these optimizations took the time down to zero, that would only be 10% savings. So the lesson here is not that I.O. optimizations aren't important, but you need to know what your job's doing in order to optimize it. So, yeah. These are some benchmarks. I'll use, let's talk about the future a little bit. We've only got like five minutes left here. Um, what does the future look like for HDFS? Well, solid state disks are definitely a big uh, thing coming up on the horizon. They're gonna have much higher bandwidth, much higher. So this slide is sort of an illustration here. Basically, that red bar is the write speed of a Fusion I.O. flash part. You can see that it's basically 10x, just about, a hard disk. So people usually think of flash as, oh, you don't have any seek. But really, it's more than just that. It's also bandwidth, substantial, substantial bandwidth. So another big trend that's coming up is networks with full bisectional bandwidth. At this point, rack locality stops being important. If you can contact any node from any other node with the same speed, that's pretty powerful. One thing to keep in mind here is that cache locality is always important. You always want to bring the computation to the cache if you can. So I would say locality doesn't completely go away, but it does become less important in some ways. But keep in mind, memory is always at least an order of magnitude faster than the network on every network I've seen. So future work is going to extend to um, making HDFS caching useful in more scenarios, caching units of less than a block, doing automatic caching using HDFS caching. Um, heterogeneous storage is another big topic. Can we allow HDFS to manage different pools of storage? Hard drives, flash, that sort of thing. Again, this is going to have a lot more benefit for some things than others. Anything that's I.O. bottlenecked will have a great future with Flash. Things that aren't, not so much. <clears throat> um, we'd like to implement Dapper-style tracing in Hadoop to be able to follow the performance of a single request of the system. To their credit, this is something Facebook has uh, done. I think that we should uh, follow in their lead there. And that would give us a much greater ability to diagnose performance issues and solve them. Um, having a pure native client, which does not involve JNI, would be very helpful for C and C++ code. Um, JNI has some overhead. That's certainly true. There's also the complexity of debugging a JNI program, which in some ways is the bigger issue for us. Um, last slide here, I promise. <laughs> um, block affinity groups. Now, this is actually pretty important, and it touches on something that uh, I heard about in the previous talk, which is, you know, let's say HBase wants to ensure that it always gets the same three nodes for its write-ahead log. How does it do that? Well, currently, it doesn't really have any way. But we'd like to provide a way with these block affinity groups, basically giving more control to the DFS client to determine where things are placed and allow more powerful strategies there. And finally, we should do some of the same improvements on the write path as on the read path, especially using native CRC. I think that's definitely a no-brainer for the, uh, for the right path. Okay. So, um, I, I can take some questions now. Hi, just out of interest, uh, did you have to add anything to, uh, in terms of write overhead to, uh, to support these read optimizations? So, I'm just thinking in terms of the, so the distribution being certain the file has been distributed to all the nodes. If did, it's busy reading from not actually the file at that point. Okay. So the question is, did we have to add write overhead to add these read optimizations? Uh, the, the answer to that is no. I don't think that any of these read optimizations involved write overhead that I can think of. Um, basically, the write path wasn't really changed by most of these optimizations. 
there are certain optimizations that we, uh, we don't do when files are open or in the process of being appended to. One of them is short circuit local reads. Uh, it's just a little too difficult to get that right when the file is being written to. So we just fall back to the older path. This is something we could fix in the future, though. I think that um, we've made progress in, in short circuit in increasing the amount of communication done between the client and the, the data node. So, so yeah, I, the summary, no. <laughs> and despite that, there's always more we could do on the right path. Anyone else? All right. Oh, one, one question in the back. Could you speak briefly about uh, the right path and particularly um, uh, the cost of writing metadata for smaller files? Um, well, I'm not sure if the cost is that much greater for small files. I mean, in general, with HDFS, the overhead that you pay with small files is the overhead of doing a lot of metadata ops. So you're always opening, you're always closing, you're always talking to the name node when you have small files. Um, so in that sense, yeah, writes are going to have more overhead, just because everything has more overhead. Um, I don't think that there's any special overhead there. I, I guess it's poorly phrased. I mean, the percentage of the time is spent is higher with, with a small file. A higher percentage of that time is spent in the metadata. Yeah. Uh, so, so I guess the question then is, how do you optimize metadata operations? Well, <laughs> that's a whole separate talk. There's been a lot of discussions about that. Um, we've been talking about splitting out the block management as a service. Federating the block management, possibly. Um, there is also federation, but federation has some limitations, which make it not suitable for most users. Um, in general, what we often find is that um, applications will be designed with certain parameters in mind. So, for example, you have file formats like Parquet that can minimize the number of small files you need. Um, it's generally better to pack things into a smaller number of, of bigger files than to have, like, let's say, a file for each key or value. So, some people would say that HBase is sort of the ultimate expression of that. Like, you know, rather than go to HDFS and write a zillion small files, I go to HBase and I have a key and then I set the value for that key. And then that's fairly cheap there compared to the price I'd be paying if I were just going through HDFS for that. So again, it's sort of a matter of fitting the tools you have with the goal you have in mind. But yeah, that's an interesting question. What else could we do to improve uh, metadata performance? Okay. Okay, so time's up. So thank you very much for that talk. And yeah. All right, thanks.